The extremely shocking letter Pilate wrote on Jesus' crucifixion. Did Pilate regret the crucifixion of Jesus? What did he do when he found out about the death of Jesus? And was he the only Roman that thought that Jesus was set up and innocent? We will cover that in this video. To find answers, some people read the Gospel of Nicodemus. The Gospel of Nicodemus, which is also known as the Acts of Pilate, is a gospel that dates back to the early days of the church. Despite being named after Nicodemus, the Pharisee who appears in the Gospel of John, it was not written by him. Rather, it is a compilation of several texts that were likely gathered over a period of time. The Gospel of Nicodemus is comprised of two parts. The first part, also known as the Acts of Pilate, details the events of Jesus' passion. In the first part, the Roman governor listens to different testimonies that are both for and against Jesus. Eventually, he gives in to the demands of the leaders to have Jesus executed. After the resurrection, Pilate receives evidence that Jesus is alive despite the Sanhedrin's attempts to cover it up. The Gospel of Nicodemus Part 2 is an appendix to the Acts of Pilate. It is narrated by two characters named Lucius and Carinus. According to the Gospel of Nicodemus, two men named Lucius and Carinus were supposedly raised from the dead by Jesus during his resurrection. They claim to have personally witnessed what occurred in hell when Jesus descended and liberated the captives. There is no evidence to suggest that the Gospel of Nicodemus is authentic. This book was written at least 300 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. It is worth noting that there are no references to the Gospel of Nicodemus in any major early Christian writings. Moreover, the book includes accounts of various events, such as Pilate's conversion to Christianity, which are not supported by the Bible. It is important to note that the Bible does not mention any men named Lucius and Carinus. Additionally, the Gospel of Nicodemus appears to have been written well after the completion of the Bible. This makes it unlikely that it was actually written by Nicodemus, Pilate, or any other person that it has been attributed to. That said, during the Middle Ages, the Gospel of Nicodemus was a famous text. It was a source of many medieval ideas, including the harrowing of hell. This idea suggests that between the crucifixion and the resurrection, Jesus went to hell, broke down its gates, and rescued the people who were held captive there. The Gospel of Nicodemus played a significant role in developing this concept. While the Gospel of Nicodemus may be an interesting read for cultural or academic reasons, it cannot be taken seriously as theology or history since it is pseudopigraphal and not a lost book of the Bible. However, we do see evidence from the Bible that shows that Pontius Pilate did not want to execute Jesus. Jesus meets Pontius Pilate Jesus had been arrested and was taken from Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. As per secular history, Pilate is portrayed as a cruel and unsympathetic person who did not value the morals of others. Pilate's marriage to Caesar Augustus' granddaughter played a crucial role in his appointment as the procurator of Judea, which he would not have achieved otherwise. John 18.31 Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge and sentence and punish him according to your own law. The Jews answered, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. It is evident that Jesus was not a victim of fate, rather he was the sovereign Lord who had planned his death. As per the records, the Jews had informed Pilate that Jesus claimed to be the Messiah and a king in opposition to Caesar. This became clear when Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? True to his Roman character, Pilate went straight to the point and demanded to know the accusation against Jesus. The religious leaders explained the matter to Pilate. John 18, 29-32 so Pilate went out to them and said, What accusations do you bring against this man? They retorted, If he were not an evildoer criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge and sentence and punish him according to your own law. The Jews answered, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word which Jesus had spoken to show, indicate, and predict by what manner of death he was to die. The religious leaders brought Jesus to Pilate with the hopes of receiving a favorable verdict. According to secular history, Pilate was known to be a ruthless and insensitive man, lacking moral sensitivity. Pilate's appointment as procurator of Judea was a result of his influential connections through marriage. His wife was the granddaughter of Caesar Augustus. Philo, an ancient Jewish scholar from Alexandria, wrote about Pilate, a corrupt and insolent person known for insulting people. He was infamous for his cruelty and habit of killing people without trial or condemnation. His inhumanity was gratuitous and most grievous. Pilate was a weak man who tried to hide his weakness by being obstinate and violent. 
His time in office was marked by several brutal outbreaks of bloodshed. They didn't want Pilate to be the judge, but rather the implementer of the sentence which they had already passed illegally. Upon realizing that the people were unwilling to provide a clear accusation against Jesus, Pilate instructed them to handle the matter themselves. He made it obvious that if they were unable to present any legitimate accusation against Jesus, he would not judge him. Instead, they would have to follow their own law and not involve the Romans. Although John did not mention it, the religious leaders did eventually provide Pilate with a more specific accusation in response to his demand. Luke 23, 2 And they began to accuse him, asserting, We found this man perverting, misleading, corrupting, and turning away our nation, and forbidding to pay tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, a King. The religious leaders did not want to judge Jesus according to their own law. They wanted him dead, but the Romans did not allow them to execute anyone under their own law. In the past, there were instances where religious leaders executed people they believed were guilty without seeking permission from the Roman authorities. One such execution by stoning is recorded in Acts 7, 54-60. It was common for these leaders to choose stoning as the method of execution. It is believed that the religious leaders may have pushed for Jesus to be crucified to fulfill the curse mentioned in Deuteronomy 21, 22 through 23. Deuteronomy 21, 22 and 23. And if a man has committed a sin worthy of death, and he is put to death, and afterwards you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but you shall surely bury him in the same day, for a hanged man is accursed by God. Thus you shall not defile your land, which the Lord your God gives you for an inheritance. Pilate intended to transfer this problem to Herod since Jesus was from Galilee, which was under Herod's rule. However, Herod returned Jesus to Pilate, which is likely the start of the second appearance. We read, This was Pilate's first encounter with the man whom the religious leaders claimed was dangerous. However, Pilate's inquiry betrayed uncertainty. Pilate had witnessed several unruly revolutionaries who professed to be kings. Pilate had expected to meet a sullen or belligerent rebel but was instead met with the calm majesty of confident superiority. He could not reconcile the character of the prisoner with the charge brought against him. We read, What have you done? As a Roman, Pilate had no interest in Jewish spiritual or social beliefs. Nonetheless, he recognized that if the religious leaders demanded the execution of Jesus, then he must have committed some offense. Pilate sought to investigate the matter and discover what it was that Jesus had done. It is possible that Jesus could have provided an incredible answer to the question, what have you done? He was sinless and never did anything wrong against God or man. He performed miraculous healings, gave sight to the blind, calmed storms, walked on water, fed multitudes, defeated demons, and even raised the dead. His teachings were so clear and powerful that they astonished his listeners. He fearlessly confronted corruption and poured his life into a few men who were destined by God to change the world. He did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. It would have been wiser for Pilate to judge the prisoner based on his actions instead of questioning what he had done. Jesus explains his kingdom to Pilate. John 18:36. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. It is possible to imagine that Pilate felt relieved and satisfied when he found out that Jesus' kingdom was not of this world. Pilate may have concluded that Rome had nothing to fear from Jesus and his kingdom. The Romans believed that they were knowledgeable about kingdoms and their power. They thought that the strength of a kingdom could be measured by its armies, navies, swords, and battles. However, Jesus knew that his kingdom, although not of this world, was more powerful than Rome and would continue to grow and influence even after Rome had faded away. We read, I find no fault in him at all. During the trial of Jesus, Pilate engaged in a conversation with the religious leaders who wished to put him to death. In the course of this conversation, Pilate made it abundantly clear that Jesus was not guilty of any crime. He went beyond stating that Jesus was not guilty of a crime deserving the death penalty. He found no fault in him at all. Pilate was fully aware of Jesus' innocence. John 18, 39 and 40 But it is your custom that I release one prisoner for you at the Passover. So shall I release for you the king of the Jews? Then they all shouted back again, 
Not him, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Judging that Jesus was innocent and different, Pilate hoped to free him through the custom of releasing a prisoner. Pilate asked the question to appeal to the crowd, hoping they would spare the man they had named as their own king from being crucified. Pilate hopes to satisfy the mob by having Jesus whipped and mocked. John 19.1 So Pilate then took Jesus and had him flogged. During the trial of Jesus, Pilate proclaimed that he found no wrongdoing in him. Despite this, he still ordered a severe and brutal punishment for a man whom he knew was innocent. Some people speculate that Pilate hoped to appease the angry mob by subjecting Jesus to scourging. Scourging was a punishment method with three purposes. It was used to punish prisoners, to obtain confessions of crimes from prisoners, and to weaken the victims in cases of crucifixion so that they would die more quickly on the cross. Pilate ordered a scourging of his prisoner in the hope that it would satisfy the crowd, not as part of the capital punishment or to elicit the truth. However, his decision was ill-judged. It is remarkable that the Gospels only use one word to describe this horrific event without attempting to manipulate our emotions. The Gospel of Matthew states that Jesus was stripped of his clothes and given a reed to mock a royal scepter. The soldiers bowed before him, offering false homage and honor while also spitting on him. However, we have the option to do the opposite of what these soldiers did to Jesus. Instead of mocking and dishonoring him, we can honor and praise him. Let us be creative in devising ways to honor our king and offer him true homage, unlike the soldiers who only pretended to do so. Pilate, as a judge, had both the responsibility and reason to set Jesus free, declaring him innocent of any wrongdoing. He made five attempts to release Jesus, as we can learn from Luke 23, 4, 15, 20, 22, and John 19, 4, 12, and 13. However, instead of setting him free, Jesus had to endure humiliation and brutality. Pilate presents Jesus to the crowd. John 19, 5 through 6. So Jesus came out wearing the thorny crown and purple cloak, and Pilate said to them, See, here is the man. When the chief priests and attendants guards saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no fault crime in him. Pilate urged the crowd to carefully ponder the suffering of the man presented before them. In a sense, Pilate spoke on behalf of God, who invites all of humanity to behold this man, the perfect man, the tested and approved ideal of all humanity. This is an invitation to witness the ultimate example of humanity in all its glory. Pilate believed that he could rescue Jesus by debasing him. Similarly, some individuals in modern times also try to do this by asserting that Jesus is not divine or that he was incorrect about certain things, in an effort to keep Jesus relevant in a progressive scientific era. However, such attempts are just as misguided as Pilate's actions. It is unclear how the crowd reacted to the situation, but it is possible that they may have felt a moment of sympathy for the strong and remarkable man involved. However, the religious leaders present immediately reacted with pure hatred towards God, screaming, Crucify him! Crucify him! The crowd might have felt sorry for the prisoner, but the priests and their followers silenced any sympathy by shouting their hatred. Pilate gets afraid. John 19, 7-11 The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he should die, because he has claimed and made himself out to be the Son of God. So, when Pilate heard this said, he was more alarmed and awe-stricken and afraid than before. He went into the judgment hall again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? To what world do you belong? But Jesus did not answer him. So Pilate said to him, Will you not speak even to me? Do you not know that I have power, authority to release you, and I have power to crucify you? Jesus answered, You would not have any power or authority whatsoever against over me, if it were not given you from above. For this reason, the sin and guilt of the one who delivered me over to you is greater. He was the more afraid. When Pilate was informed that Jesus had proclaimed himself as the Son of God, he did not react with anger or amusement. Instead, he was filled with an even greater fear than before. Even in his beaten, bloodied, and spat upon state, Pilate saw something in Jesus that made him consider the possibility that Jesus was not an ordinary man. The phrase, more afraid, could actually carry a superlative force, as often seen in New Testament Greek, and could be translated as, exceedingly afraid. 
Pilate was not a particularly religious man, but the news of Jesus' divine claims terrified him. During that time, all Romans were familiar with stories of gods or their offsprings appearing in human form. He knew this innocent man, a man not like any other prisoner he had seen before, should be set free. Yet he felt the full force of the crowd and religious leaders demanding his crucifixion. Pilate presented Jesus before the crowd in judgment seat. However, in truth, it was Pilate who was being judged, not Jesus. Pilate presented Jesus thorn-crowned and beaten to the people. The people rejected Jesus. They were driven by hate and deliberately disowned their hope for a Messiah, as well as their national pride. By rebelling against Christ, they ultimately surrendered to a tyrant. During the trial of Jesus, it may seem that Pilate was the one judging him, but in reality, it was Jesus who was judging Pilate. Unfortunately, Pilate failed the test. Fearing the crowd, he decided to send an innocent man to a gruesome death. This is the reason why the ancient creed specifically states that Jesus was crucified during the reign of Pontius Pilate. As per Roman tradition, Jesus carried his own cross from the place of his sentencing to the place of a skull, where he was to be crucified. In those times, the Romans would put the cross on the condemned man and force him to carry it in a public procession to draw attention to his crime and fate. The Persians were the first to invent crucifixions, but the Romans perfected it and made it a common practice. This form of punishment was reserved for the worst criminals and the lowest classes, and its purpose was to inflict slow, painful, and humiliating death upon the victim in public. Jesus, in accordance with God's will, submitted to this exact form of death which was intended for him. Archaeologists found in 1968 the remains of a man crucified in Jesus' era. The study of the remains indicated that the victim was nailed to the cross in a sitting position, both legs over sideways, with the nail penetrating the sides of both feet just below the heel. The arms were stretched out with a nail in each forearm. Dr. Nico Haas, a professor of anatomy at Hebrew University, described it as a compulsive position, a difficult and unnatural posture, designed to increase the sufferer's agony. According to archaeological evidence and ancient texts, Pontius Pilate, the prefect of Judea, who was responsible for sentencing Jesus of Nazareth to be crucified, was a cruel leader. His main objective was to advance the interest of Rome in the Judean province. Pilate was also self-serving and understood the importance of maintaining the support of Emperor Tiberius. However, Pilate's cruelty and his habit for executing men without a proper trial led to his recall to Rome in 37 AD, where he was tried and punished. Eusebius, a historian, reports that Pilate eventually fell into misfortune and became his own executioner. However, Pilate was not the only man that knew Jesus was innocent that day. The head Roman officer also knew this. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw him expire this way, he said, Really, this man was God's son. Mark 15, 39. The final moments of Jesus' life are chronicled in Mark 15, 33-39. After enduring abandonment, ridicule, humiliation, and torture, Jesus takes his last breath while hanging on the cross. Mark 15, 33. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At noon, the sky turned dark and it remained so till 3 p.m. This unusual darkness occurred despite the sun being at its highest point. As the moon was full, it couldn't have been a result of an eclipse since the moon cannot come between the sun and the earth in its full phase. This darkness was believed to have been caused by God's intervention. Phlegon of Trales, a freedman of Emperor Adrian, describes an exceptional event that took place. Eusebius, in his records of the year AD, extensively quotes Phlegon, who claims that a massive eclipse of the sun happened in the fourth year of the 202nd Olympiad, which was greater than any previous eclipses. During this event, at the sixth hour of the day, it became so dark that it was like nighttime and stars were visible in the sky. Moreover, there was a significant earthquake in Bithynia, which caused the destruction of many houses in the city of Nicaea. Phlegon describes a period of darkness, which he attributes to an eclipse. This is understandable as astronomy knowledge was limited at the time. Phlegon also mentions an earthquake which aligns with the sacred narrative. 
St. Cyprian adds that the sun was forced to withdraw its rays and close its eyes so as not to witness the crime of the Jews. St. Chrysostom similarly states that the sun, as a creation of God, could not bear the wrongdoing committed by humans. Therefore it withdrew its rays so as not to behold the deeds of the wicked. Mark 15.34 And at the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me, deserting me and leaving me helpless and abandoned? Those who lingered around the cross despite the mysterious darkness are mentioned in verse 35. The darkness would certainly add to the dreadfulness of the situation. It was out of that darkness that the voice of Jesus was heard. It was out of that darkness that the voice of Jesus was heard. And inasmuch as Elias or Elijah was believed to hold some relation to the Messiah, it was natural for some of those who stood by to understand the words to mean that our Lord was actually calling for Elias. Mark 15, 36 And one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink, saying, Let alone, let us see whether Elias will come to take him down. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. There were two veils, one before the holy place and the second before the holy of holies. The holy place would agree to what we call the nave of the church, in which the priests were always present. The holy of holies would match to our chancel choir, the holiest part of the building. This was always kept closed, nor might anyone enter it but the high priest, and that only once in the year on the day of expiation. The veil which was rent at our Lord's death was that which was placed before the holies of holies. It was called the paraketh. It was the responsibility of the officiating priest on the evening of the day of preparation at the hour of evening prayer, which would correspond to the time of our Lord's death, to enter into the holy place, where he would of course be between the two curtains or veils, the outer veil and the inner veil. It would then be his responsibility to roll back the outer veil, exposing the sacred space to the people in the outer court. Then and there, to their amazement, they would witness the inner veil ripped apart from the top to the bottom. According to Josephus, these veils or curtains were of immense bulk, heavy and beautifully embroidered with gold and purple. This tearing of the veil now meant, first, dispensation, with its rites and ceremonies, was now uncovered by Christ, and that thenceforth the middle wall of partition was broken down, so that now, not the Jews only, but the Gentiles also might draw nigh by the blood of Christ. But second, it also implies that the way to heaven was laid open by our Lord's death. When thou hadst overcome the sharpness of death, thou didst open the kingdom of heaven to all believers. The veil implied that heaven was closed to all, until Christ by his death rent this veil in twain and laid open the way. Mark 15, 39 And when the centurion which stood over against him saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. The words so cried out are not in the most important authorities. The centurion's job was to keep an eye on everything and see that the sentence was carried out. He must have been standing close to the crest, and there was something in the dying sufferer's entire demeanor that was so unlike anything he had ever seen before that it elicited the spontaneous cry, Truly this man was the Son of God. He had observed him during those long and trying hours. He had witnessed the patient humility and regal composure of the sufferer. He had listened intently to those words which held such great significance for those who followed the Christian faith that were spoken intermittently by the sufferer as he hung there. Finally, he heard a sudden, piercing cry that was so startling and unexpected that it startled him. It was only then that he could arrive at no other conclusion except that the sufferer was indeed the Son of God. In just a few verses, Mark conveys a lot of significant events. Among them, the Roman officer who admired Jesus after he died stands out. Jesus had a unique influence on his followers. Now, the centurion who oversaw Jesus' crucifixion had to remark that he was the Son of God. At the beginning of his ministry, Jesus kept his identity hidden, but now it was plain for everyone to see. As a commander, the centurion was in control of the soldiers who dealt with Jesus. Did he participate in the soldiers' taunting and beating of Jesus as they crowned him with thorns? It's uncertain. Perhaps he was too respectable for such behavior. 
Maybe he was the one who gave Simon of Cyrene the task of carrying Jesus' cross. Once they arrived at Golgotha, the place of the crucifixion, the nails were driven through Jesus' wrist and he was raised up the cross. This was just another day at the office, really. His function was to supervise the execution of offenders via crucifixion. But somewhere along the way, Jesus ceased to appear to him as a common criminal. Perhaps it was the way Jesus engaged with the world's powers. He never begged for his life. Perhaps it was Jesus' words of love from the cross that moved him. Perhaps it was the strange darkness that blanketed the land. Maybe it was the tearing of the veil. Alternatively, perhaps Jesus had imparted truth to this officer as they traveled down the road. Something stirred in this man's soul as he gazed at Jesus' lifeless body, whatever it was. I imagine him staring up at the cross, mouth gaping, as he wraps words around his thoughts. This man truly was the Son of God. What a declaration for a Roman officer to make. If any of the religious leaders overheard him, they would have lost their minds. They just spent the previous day persuading Rome to execute Jesus precisely because he was blaspheming about being God's son. It's one thing to recognize Jesus as the son of God when he's alive. Peter recognizes Jesus as the Messiah in Mark 8, 29-30. And he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Peter answereth and saith unto him, Thou art the Christ. And he charged them that they should tell no man of him. When Jesus is alive, it's one thing to recognize him as the Son of God. It's another thing to recognize Jesus as the Son of God after the resurrection. Many people came to faith then. But to recognize Jesus as the Son of God when he is dead and all hope is gone? This Roman officer may be the only person to have done such a thing. So, what happened to the Roman officer? We have no idea. I'm sure he had a lot on his mind in the days ahead, especially as word spread that Jesus was still alive. Perhaps he realized the gravity of his crimes against Jesus. What we do know is that it wasn't too late for him. While on the cross, Jesus was paying the cost for this officer's sins. He was paving the way for this officer to be with his father. As Stuart Townen wrote in the hymn How Deep the Father's Love for Us, Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. We need to realize that Jesus died for you. Do not reject him once you've known him. Once you've heard the gospel and rejected it, you can never be the same. It says that when the rich young ruler rejected Christ, he turned away and grieved, emotionally disturbed. Because when you reject the claims of Christ, that's a very serious thing. It will be an hour of decision for many of you who will receive him today. Let us pray. Divine Creator, we come before you with humble hearts, seeking your guidance and wisdom as we delve into the sacred scriptures of the Bible. You have blessed us with this precious gift, a treasure trove of knowledge and truth that holds the key to understanding your will for our lives. Grant us the grace to comprehend its teachings and apply them to our daily existence. Grant us clarity, O Lord, as we open our hearts and minds to receive the messages hidden within the passages of the Bible. Let your Holy Spirit illuminate the words, revealing their deeper meanings and significance. Help us to grasp the timeless truths contained within its passages and to apply them to our lives in a practical and meaningful way. Father, we acknowledge that understanding your word requires more than just intellectual comprehension. It requires a spiritual awakening, a transformation of the heart. So we pray that you would soften our hearts and open our spirits to receive your truth with humility and sincerity. Help us to approach the Bible with reverence and awe, recognizing its authority as your inspired word. May we read it with an open mind, free from preconceived notions or biases, allowing your truth to penetrate our souls and renew our minds. Grant us the patience and perseverance to study your word diligently, not just for the sake of knowledge, but for the purpose of transformation. Let it be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, guiding us in the way of righteousness and leading us closer to you. Lord, we confess that there are times when we struggle to understand certain passages or teachings in the Bible. In those moments, grant us the humility to seek guidance from those who are more knowledgeable and experienced in your word. Help us to approach them with teachable hearts, eager to learn and grow in our understanding of your truth. We also pray for discernment, O Lord, to distinguish between your word and the interpretations of fallible human beings. Protect us from false teachings and doctrines that lead us astray, 
and empower us to test everything against the standard of your word. Above all, Father, may our study of the Bible lead us into a deeper relationship with you. May it draw us closer to your heart and conform us more closely to the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us to live out the principles and values found in your word, that we may be a light shining in a dark world, pointing others towards the hope and salvation found in you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. However, there was another man there that knew Jesus was innocent before he died. However, unlike Pilate and the Roman officer, this man was a criminal. To watch that video, click here.